Welcome to the KFPL Weekly VOD, and make sure to smash that like and subscribe button on our channels to help support our analytics. Let's look at the results from this past weekend's Archon Solo event. We had one event based on the UK time zone and the other based on Eastern Standard Time Zone in the US. The results were in third place in the east, Vince Tuck on the Lord of Hyperburg. And in third place on the west was Aeroyak on H. Hugh Errante del Monolithio di Diamante. In second place in the east was Echo Ido on Prasateri Julius Blaisakwika and Ugluk on Unili Nelson Lenyuk. Ugluk was also able to requalify after unqualifying himself to play and earn the title of Mad Lad. So now let's take a look, uh, a look at these first place decks. So in the east we had Lorenzo winning with the specialist Sandstrom Griefenswald and Mal winning with Gargoyle. And I'm not going to try to pronounce the rest of this name because I don't want to butcher it worse than I would. So here are the two first place decks and congratulations to all six people who qualified for the league. And now, let's deep dive the keys to victory. Thank you to LP for sponsoring our events. And now I'm gonna bring in the Screech ba -bomb guys. The Lord of Hyperberg is a board focused deck taking control of your opponent's board and key cost before utilizing increased hand side to finish with Obsidian Forge. It's piloted by Vince of the Manchester Mavericks. The opening game for Lord of Hyperberg generally wants to focus on logos, as most decks do. With cards like Sloppy Lab Work and Daughter, you can increase your hand size, increase the amount of draw you're getting off that turn one. Other options include playing down key artifacts like Obsidian Forge, Pale Star, and Animator. These can be used to control both the board and your opponent's artifact, or, or set up a big finisher towards the end. What does the mid game look like? The mid game generally wants to do two things. Firstly, it wants to create a, bo a, he a board with a lot of different threats on. Whether this is gluttony and greed, giving you hand size and ways to ways to take captured ember to your pool, or whether it's Faust the Great and Citizen Tricks, increasing the key cost and stealing ember from your opponent, or Ludo, for another way of taking ember that's been captured onto creatures into away from your going back to your opponent. It's also looking to disrupt your opponent. This is done in two ways. Firstly, with cards like City State Interest to capture your opponent's ember and stop them forging. Also, you have cards in, in Dis, such as such as Infernus to remove remove ember and cards from your, dis, your opponent's discard pile. Maleficon to do damage, and using the Pale Start with cards like Pain Reaction, Diametric Charge, and Positron Bolt to control your opponent's board board as much as possible. What's the end game look like? Generally, this card, this deck is angling to use the Obsidian Forge to forge a final key with a disc with a disc board. There are seven creatures in disc, generally making it easy to get a lot of creatures on the board in a disc turn. And furthermore, with cards like Daughter and Greed, you can generally get quite big hand size, allowing you to have a lot of disc cards in your in your hand to play out on that turn and get that final key out of nowhere. How do you beat this deck? The first thing you want to do generally is you want to stop the card draw as much as possible. That means getting rid of the cards like Greed and like Daughter to restrict Hyperberg as much as possible and stop it playing as playing as many cards and stop it being able to get to make it being as easy to get those seed and forge turns. Secondly, don't be afraid to let Ember go back to the common supply. There's two Ludos in this deck, and it means that sometimes when you destroy soaring creatures, you'll be seeing that Ember go back to the pool. This is a shame, but it's much better than leaving it there and ending up with a glossy on the board you can't deal with and seeing that Ember go to Hyperbird's controller's pool instead. This is a very strong deck that's very hard to beat. Hopefully this deck chat will help you next time you come up against it. Thank you. Rastery Julius is a pit-focused deck looking to cycle quickly and outrun your opponent. It's piloted by Echo Edo from Team Sass. Some good early game plays from this deck could be could be using, for example, Mindfire to Discard random cards from your opponent's hands, hopefully fishing for something that, can, that your opponent wants to use in mid or late game that you can later then purge with the Infernus. Other options will be playing the Scylla or Charybdis. These are both excellent cards to get on the board early that are hard to get rid of while also disrupting your opponent's your opponent's ability to play to play their game by preventing them from reaping or from fighting. What we want to do in the mid game. The mid game will generally be focused around playing as many pips as possible and cycling your deck accordingly. This can be done with the three that have logic in the deck, but also cards 
like Nero Siphon and Eclectic Inquiry, given this deck at 16 speed. You'll also want me to use Soaring to slow down your opponent. You have cards like City State Interest, as well as Battle, and M4 Capture, all great ways of capturing the Ember from your opponent. Finally, you'll be using you'll be using the disc to disrupt your opponent. Cards like Implosion to just hit key creatures, well key creatures, while also sending your opponent your your own cards to the discard to then recycle key cards like Infernus and Umbrafiend, further removing your opponent's Ember by getting those back with cards like Stirring Grave and Grim Reminder. What does the end game look like? You have cards like Mark of Dis. This to prevent Zonimus knock you off, knock you off forging a key by locking them into a house they may not want to play. Play and with the cycling in this deck, you can often get around to this more times than you would with any other deck. The other option is just simply pr producing too much Ember for your for your opponent to deal with. With 16 pips in the deck and all the cycling you've got, you're often going to be playing playing three, four, even five or six Ember on a turn, and that's often too much for an opponent to deal with. So how would I beat this deck? Firstly, this deck doesn't have great board control, with only an axiom of Grisk as a, as a big board wipe. If you can get a foothold on this board with 14 creatures, this, this deck doesn't have great response, especially against Saurians where they often have Ember on them. Secondly, having many pips in the deck means it's vulnerable to things like Unfurs in two ways. Firstly, that Unfurs is going to give you Ember control and help you knock off some of those pips that this deck is getting from, from playing cards repeatedly. But secondly, it's going to make those cycles less and less effective. Still, it's a very powerful deck and it can't, and it has a lot of versatility and is good at both both controlling Ember, producing Ember, and, and also stopping your opponent from doing the things they want to do. Specialist Sandstorm Greetsbold is a board-heavy deck looking to limit opponents' options and disrupt their game plan while reaping out for the win. It's piloted by Lorenzo from the Hamburg Atlanteans. The early game, you'll be looking to archive key cards with cards like Causal Loop and Sloppy Lab Work. Lab work. You'll also be looking to play down cards like Technofiend, which give you which you draw in a non-Logos house, which when Logos is where a lot of the speeds of this deck comes from. What does the mid-game look like? The mid-game is primarily disruption. And all three houses can do this. The Sanctum is looking to disrupt by removing effects. These can be destroyed effects with a card like Purifier of Souls, or steel effects with a card like the Vault Keeper, both of which can limit can limit the destroyed effects of, of Saurium with cards like Ludo and uh, Curious Saurus, and the sh and shadows of all sets with the Vault Keeper's st stopping stealing effects. Logos looks to stop your opponent using using their board, whether it's with Opposition Reacher stopping you reaping or Skippy Time Hole stopping you use any using any of any creatures at all. Dis looks to stop you doing further work and undo the work you've already done. Mark of Dis can force you into into the houses you don't want to play, whereas Break Key can can remove any hard work you've done by getting an early key and getting ahead of Specialist. What does the late game look like? The late game is about is about generating a board and keeping it. With twenty three creatures in the deck, you're often going to have more creatures than your opponent and be able to use use it to do advantageous fights using using excellent cards for fighting like Adaptoid and Baldrick the Bold, both of which can get you Ember while fighting. Once you've got that board, you'll be looking to reap out as much as possible. Sanctum in particular is a very creature-heavy house, but also you'll see a lot of creatures in adapt in logos and dis as well. You also have cards like Life Screen of Favian, which can be used to steal your opponent's ember with a total of seven capture icons in the deck. How do you beat this deck? Despite having a very good board score of 23, it hasn't got any board clear. This means that if you can get a board clear at the right time to clear away all specialist creatures and they can start building your own board, sometimes you can outboard it and wrest that control from specialist. Furthermore, with the deck being so reliant, some decks with, with cards like Quixelstone or Fangtooth don't rely on using the board at all and can just repeatedly clear the board, stopping specialist from doing anything and really and really and really stopping it against its win condition of reaping out. Thank you. In the Western Bracket Breakdown by the Screech Bomb guys and the good Dr. Calum. But let's switch our focus now to the Western Team Bracket and Call of the Week with Brobnar89 and Shaka. This is Brobnar89. This is Shaka. And we run our show Call of the Week. Today we're going to be taking a look at the three top decks from the KFPL Archon Qualifier, taking a look at those decks that won. This is a deck from Call of the Archons, and it looks like an anti-MM pick. Here we have Too Much Protect. That's a that's a big issue against Mass Mutation. A customs Office, many of the best artifacts in all of Keyforge are in Mass Mutation, mm -hmm. and a lot of those decks rely on them. There are not many creatures in this deck. It's making them difficult for them to utilize Mark of Dis. And put you into a bad house. Can't even mark you in the shadows at all. 
grasping vines, if you made a mistake of playing your artifacts to send them back to your hand, and then you have to pay to put them pay back. Pay again to put them down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, they could put a mimicry away. And whenever you play your best action, okay, you just they hit you with it right back. Yeah, you could have a more effective mark of diss than they did. Yep. <laughs> and if you discard it, or it's still, they could still use it. Mm-hmm. Control the weak is in here. Dance of Doom that could be particularly nasty. One sided board wipe. Uh, hysteria for all the capture that you're doing. Okay, they just got all the amber back. And if you're in mass mutation, you're not going to be uh, capturing them down again or mass amber control or anything like that. It doesn't. It's not that efficient with the cards, but the actual. Uh, actions in this deck have such powerful effects that every turn is going to feel pretty imposing. Yeah, the Hysteria is essentially a board wipe here because you only have five creatures between the other two houses. So everything that you pick up, you're basically going to be able to put back down on that same turn. Yep. You know, if you pick up the Urchin again, you're happy. Between the Hysteria and the Dance of Doom, I think you could do a lot of damage to MM boards because there's so many annoying creatures hanging out at two or three power that you're just going to be able to wipe out with dance of doom yep and and that's a great point about the hysteria like you don't get chains from bouncing creatures in the wrong house back to your Mm -hmm. hand you can really see the triple nocturnal maneuvers being a huge nuisance for a mm deck yep too much to protect lots to follow up on with the too much to protect Two Nerf Blasts and an Urchin keep them from forging after you steal all that amber. This is a solid Coda deck, and I think performs particularly well against Mass Mutation decks. Definitely. Here we've got another pretty speedy deck. Lots of efficiency coming from Armory Officer Nell. Pretty bad uh, when you have it. Bad for the opponent. <laughs> when you have a Transporter platform, up to five upgrades here. It's drawing ten cards in the most extreme case logos you could set up a pretty nice board uh, bouncing death quark and entropic swirl take care of any uh, issues and you can waste your own infomorphs or other creatures you might not care about or you could kill creatures you do care about have good play effects like infernus and then you reverse time to get them back this here you have a board clear with gateway followed by mark of this etense jar is a great tech card against whatever their answers might be. Not much amber control here. Not much amber generation here either. But if they're threatening the second key, like they could be threatening the third key at the same time because of the Obsidian Forge. I think if you get the Infernuses out of here, uh, this deck's got a lot of problems. Yeah, I think the way that this deck deals with its low amber control is by being super efficient and getting back to those Infernuses. And so simultaneously controlling your amber and just picking your deck to pieces. So if you can get rid of the Infernuses, if you can purge them out somehow, that's really going to help you out. Reverse time is a huge problem. Being able to draw back into Mark of Dis, Bouncing Death Quark, and of course the Infernuses, uh, really, really going to put you in a tight spot. And the Ethan's Jar is just horribly obnoxious. I think the plan with Ethan's Jar is probably to stop whatever you're artifact control is just shut it down so that he can be guaranteed to have use of his transporter platform throughout the game guaranteed to be able to set up a nice big obsidian forge and guaranteed to be able to keep discarding to get that efficiency off the auto encoder gargoyle very strong deck that really focuses on efficiency Almost every card in Logos is going to be trying to get you more efficient, get more cards in your hand, get more cards in your archive. You've got your Eclectic Inquiries, you've got your Lethologica, you've got your Auto Encoder, and you've got your Kronos. Kronos coming in here with 10 draw icons in the deck, so you can get a lot of stuff into your archive with Kronos there. Subject Kirby over in Star Alliance is also going to be helping you out. With that efficiency, Star Alliance also giving you some board wipes with Catrino Flux and Red Alert. You could definitely see discarding creatures to auto encoder to dig for that Red Alert and also make it more effective for you by having fewer creatures on the board. The M4 Captura with all the icons can become quite oppressive 
have 15 amber pips, one capture, five damage, 10 draw. Uh, so this is pretty much taking off check whenever it wants. And if that amber goes on the creature with the encounter suit, it's going to be pretty challenging to get it back, particularly if it's protected by a secure droid. And the Faust with the Amphora is a nasty combo. Could make you pay a lot for keys. Yeah, yeah. If you are packing any artifact control, you probably want to hold it for the Captura. Yeah. And you're also going to want to make sure you hit Kronos and probably want to hit Faust and Ludo as soon as they hit the board because... With all that capture, Faust and Ludo are going to give you a lot of trouble deleting your Amber, increasing your key cost, and Kronos is going to be able to make the deck super, super efficient. And you do not want the encounter suit landing on any of those creatures. Yeah, the only ways I see to beat this deck are by bursting before the M4 comes out or by purging some of the important cards. Otherwise, this is just too fast. So a special shout out to Call of the Week and the Screech Bomb Boys for doing those two quick top threes from each of the two events. But our next event is coming up, and it is this weekend. And that event is going to be a sealed event. Yes, a sealed event. And that sealed event is going to be fantastic, as you're going to get one deck from each of the four different uh, uh, sets that are out, and you'll get to pick... uh, which one you want to play the mass mutations you'll be able to allocate pips as long as each of the uh ma- the standard cards have at least one pip each um for more information on this go to the www.crazykillingmachinenetwork.co.uk um website and register up and sign up for all the events that we got coming up we'd like to see you in season two and this is the keyforge premier league and i am fifth planet keyforge from manly saying catch you on the flip side